Uh, first, just... all right, I'm going to continue. Uh, thank you very much, David. Uh, just housekeeping, can, can you hear me and, and see my presentation? Everything is in place? David? All right, we're good. All right, just wanted to make sure. So again, David said, my name is Mike Emery. I'm the site administrator of the Cornwall Iron Furnace, uh, but I spent 13 years uh, at Landis Valley Museum. Uh, from 2005 to 2018. And over that time, did research on various uh, buildings and things on site. Uh, the Landis Valley House Hotel uh, was one of my uh, research projects uh, that I ended up doing it and did uh, some presentations about it while they're on staff. And I know I look down through the list, I see uh, many people that are associated with the museum that were there uh, when I was there. Probably some of you heard a little bit of this information, uh, but also during the closure, Jen Royer, uh, who was a curator at the museum, uh, is putting together more information about the hotel for some uh, signage uh, to go into that building. So uh, she was running uh, by some of the ideas that she had, and I would do some additional research. Uh, so this is something that I actually you know, started looking at again uh, even though I'm here at, uh, at Cornwall Iron Furnace. So if I can go ahead and get things going here, and away we go. So the first slide that I have up is of two buildings that are not at Landis Valley. Uh, you can see that one is labeled as the Welsh Mountain Inn uh, that had been run by uh, John Ammon of, uh, in Salisbury Township, Lancaster County. The second one is Peter Emery's Tavern, yes, spelled slightly different than my last name, in, in Honeybrook Township, Chester County. Uh, the reason why I have a picture of these two buildings is that I've had a long interest in, in taverns and public houses uh, before I was ever at Landis Valley. And these two particular buildings are taverns that were owned by ancestors of mine. Uh, the top one is a, a third great-grandfather. The bottom one is a fourth great-grandfather of mine. Both of these were in the community that I grew up in. Both my mother and my father's family had lived in that community, uh, their families, uh, since the 18th century. Uh, and as I started doing more family history and digging, I started running into more and more relatives uh, that owned and operated taverns, as well as doing different things. Like Peter Emery, for example, uh, in 1816 was taxed as a distiller. Uh, but by the late 1820s, he started uh, petitioning to be a tavern owner. And at one time, uh, two of his brothers-in-law also were, ran taverns in Honeybrook Township along Route 322. Uh, and also his son uh, actually ran this tavern after, after Peter had put up. So I've had this kind of long interest in, in taverns and public houses. But the one that we're really going to talk about is, of course, at Landis Valley. And this slide is a, kind of a satellite view of Landis Valley proper. And if you can see uh, my cursor here on the screen, uh, the current outline of the property at Landis Valley, kind of starting at the north at Kissel Hill Road, runs along uh, the tree line down all the way uh, to 272, uh, up along 272, accepting in the area that's owned by uh, the Mennonite Church, which is here, takes in all of this area, uh, and comes up behind the federal barn and then runs all the way back to the point of the beginning. So this is the modern parking lot. This is where the visitor center is located. And right here where my cursor now is located, that's where the hotel is, is located. And you can see that that hotel sat at the intersection of what was historically this road known as the Reading Road at one point, the road that went to the north, which was the Kissel Hill Road, and the road that went to the west, which was the Nassville Road. So it was a, an ideal location uh, for a, a public house or a tavern. Now, 
a lot of folks would would think that if you went back early enough in time in Pennsylvania, say into the 1800s or even the 1700s, that you think that just any person could put out a shingle and start selling, you know, alcohol and, and have people come in and uh, and stay at your house. But no, this was something that was a regulated thing even back two and 300 years ago within Pennsylvania. I know uh, many years ago, I had purchased a couple of law books. Uh, one was uh, a book called Conductor Generalis that had been uh, printed in, in the United States as early as the 1720s. Uh, my version is from the 1790s and law of Pennsylvania from about 1805. And as you look through them, they have very large and healthy areas that deal primarily with the keeping of what they'll call a hotel, a tavern, a public house, an alehouse. So, you know, just like what we have on and the property at Landis Valley, the hotel proper, but also the reconstructed tavern that's there as well. So these were legally defined and licensed. Uh, and they were licensed every each and every year. And when they were licensed, they licensed not only the location. So if you think about today, a liquor license usually would go with a building. So they're not only uh, giving essentially a liquor license for that building, but they're also giving it to a, a specific individual. So think about that, that every year this runs through the court system. And this would be heard by what's known as the court of quarter sessions. They would meet four times a year. So that's where that quarter sessions comes from. And uh, the keepers were responsible for things like underage drinking, uh, the content of the alcohol that you're actually selling what you say you're selling, uh, the amount that would be served. Uh, so they are actually having you know, weights and measures coming around and saying that your pints are pints and your quarts are quarts. Uh, they're also responsible for uh, serving and housing the public uh, and their horses. That's the other thing that these taverns and hotels not only are serving uh, people, but serving uh, the animals that they're, they're bringing as well. Uh, and they're also responsible for theft while uh, people and property is in their care. Uh, so that's why when you see uh, tavern partitions, which you'll see one in a moment, uh, they oftentimes have lots and lots of signatures on it. And, and this was all a holdover from the colonial British system. So if you would look at a tavern uh, partition, partition, sorry, uh, in the 1750s, it would look the same in the 1850s. So after we had gone off of this British model, this was something that was kept from that old model. So this is something that's a very old tradition here uh, in Pennsylvania. So this is an example of, uh, of course, this is a, a photograph of the Landis Valley House Hotel as it that stands today. But on the right hand side, this is one of the tavern uh, petitions. And this is for uh, 1876. Uh, it was given to a man by the name of Henry Brackbill, who we'll talk about later. And it describes this, and you can see where I have written there, the petition of the undersigned is desirous of keeping a hotel in the township of Mannheim to accommodate the public with two or more bedrooms and four or more beds, this being an old stand. So what that refers to is that this had already been a tavern at one time. So this was a renewal. And there was usually a different threshold given for someone who wanted to keep a new tavern at a new location, as opposed to someone who had kept it before at what they're referring to as an old stand. And if you look at that uh, petition, you can see that there are a couple dozen names at the bottom. Uh, one I'd like to draw your attention to, if you can see my cursor going over, is that of H.H. H. Landis. So the L Landis Valley was founded by two brothers, uh, Henry and George Landis. Their father was a man by the name of Henry Harrison Landis, oftentimes goes by H.H. H. Landis for short. So this is a signature of H.H. H. Landis and many of his and Henry Brackbill's neighbors. Mike, it's uh, David. There's a, a question 
with the documentation you just showed, and maybe if you're going to address this later on in your talk, um, are there inventories, ledgers, or any other kinds of records that survive uh, from the Landis Valley Hotel, either the Landis occupation or prior to that? Of the hotel, no. That's the unfortunate thing is I've never seen any records like ledgers or day books from the hotel. What does survive, however, are the official files that had to be filed within the courthouse. So uh, the courthouse records, in, uh, that's something that's kept uh, differently in Pennsylvania by county. So the, uh, the public house uh, or tavern petitions would have been kept by the county originally, but the county has actually turned over in this case a lot of that documentation, including, including those petitions, over to the Lancaster County Historical Society, now LancasterHistory.org. If you go to Chester County, for example, there's a government services building that has an archives, and that's where the tavern, tavern petitions are there. In Berks County, they're in a slightly different location, so it's kept by county. But in, in this case, really the only records that we have, and, and I'm going to go through and talk a little bit about where I sussed out you know, some of these things, but unfortunately none of it was from a lot of primary documentation uh, that exists on site or is even known in private collections. Great, thank you. Sure. Now this is an image of uh, a map from 1853. Uh, there was a series of maps that was done in and around Lancaster County and they were done at, the, at just the township level. So they're maps that are highly detailed. And, and thank goodness in Mannheim Township, one was drawn for it. And uh, this particular map that I took this photo uh, from actually hangs in the Landis house. Uh, there is a, a kind of a room set up as a study or an office. And it's not really visible from the doorway as you walk in, but into the left-hand side is this very large map. And if you look at this map, you can see I have marked out where the, the hotel is located. But I also want to point out this farm here uh, that says Henry Landis. Uh, now, I talked about Henry and George Landis, the founders of the museum. Their father was also named H.H. or Henry Landis. His father was also Henry Landis. So in 1853, this was referring to the grandfather of George and Henry Landis, who owned uh, this farm, the house of which still survives along uh, Route 272, just north of the museum. Uh, all the rest of the buildings uh, have been demolished. The other thing I'd like you to look at is this property here. You can see JB Landis 11A. That stands for Jacob Landis 11 acres. And you also see the name Elizabeth Landis. Well, this farm is uh, today what we call the brick farm. So this building that I have the cursor on is the brick farmhouse. This building that I have the cursor on is the Grossmutter's house. So what's happened is that Jacob Landis Sr. dies in 1848. So his widow is Elizabeth Landis is living in the Grossmutter house and the son, Jacob Landis Jr., is living in the brick house. So that's why you have that ownership uh, differences there. And you can see the hotel doesn't exist. It wouldn't be built for another couple of years. The Landis Brothers house doesn't exist. The Isaac Landis house doesn't exist. The only other thing that's really in the neighborhood is the Mennonite church and really just the cemetery. The church that was there at this period is gone and then subsequently moves across the street. So this is what that farmhouse, that Jacob Landis, what we call the brick farmhouse at Landis Valley, looked like in a, a painting that uh, Landis Valley has. So here's the brick farmhouse, the gross motor, and also this barn, which is now gone. You can see that there is a Conestoga wagon with just a single horse coming down what would have been uh, the Reading Road. And above it is a panoramic photo that was taken by uh, Henry Landis uh, right around 1900. This is a section of that photo. And even at this time period, um, you know, the farm looks very similar uh, to this. Now, Jacob Landis Sr. 
uh, the person who did, I'll go back for a second, most of the building uh, of what the buildings that you see here was a blacksmith. And one of the reasons why he picked this location, uh, well, there's a couple of reasons. Number one, his father-in-law owned it first uh, and transferred title uh, to Jacob. But it had been the stand of a blacksmith, even we think into the 1790s prior to, uh, to Mr. Kaufman's owning of that property. So Jacob Land, a senior, is a blacksmith. The objects that you see there are all made by him and are in the Landis Valley Museum collection. Uh, so you can see the two different styles of axes, the small hatchet, and these really fantastic uh, cleavers. So it did really fine work, but you could see it's very advantageous for a blacksmith to have an area that is near uh, the meeting house, which gets founded right around the time that he, uh, that he passes. You have the Nestville Road and uh, the Kissel Hill Road coming in very close to the property and along what is uh, the Reading Road. And his son even uh, also uh, is a blacksmith. His name was, was John Landis. And the picture on the top is of the Shriner wagon uh, that's in the collection Landis Valley on the Shriner farm, which was just a little bit further up the road. And uh, sometime we think probably in the 1830, 40 period, uh, Mr. Shriner, also Henry Shriner, uh, took the wagon to go ahead and have it refitted. And the, uh, the box hardware from the wagon box, you could see in the large photo, actually has this John Landis' stamp in it. So we know that it had been uh, through the blacksmith shop, most likely there uh, at the brick farm. So this image is kind of a stripped away image of what uh, Landis Valley looks like now with all the different roads. And you could see the Oregon Pike Route 272 clearly marked. That's a bypass road. That's a, a relatively modern road that was actually put there to take the main road out of the museum. So the old road is what I have marked here in kind of this bluish area that runs through. And this is all road that's extant. That's still there. You can actually go on parts of this. Then at a certain point, you'll hit the gate at Landis Valley. This is then an interior road. Uh, this other part of the road takes you down to what's now an annex uh, cemetery for the Landis Valley Mennonite Church. And this area that I have marked in red no longer exists, but you can see where the roadbed comes through and then uh, comes on to uh, Route 272. Same thing with the Nashville Road uh, and also here uh, for the Kissel Hill Road. So this main artery is, is why uh, the hotel would be built. Uh, really in this location. And a lot of why the hotel would be built is traffic. Uh, of course, that's along the road. So this is a, a great early image of a family bringing a Conestoga wagon filled of tobacco into the city of Lancaster. So you had a lot of trade that was coming in from what was northwestern uh, Lancaster County. The road that came down through Landis Valley, what I've referred to as the Reading Road, early on was laid out in the 1730s, went up to Ephrata, and then when uh, Reading was built in, in 1748, the road was extended up. So at that time period, though, that was all the way up to the river was northern Lancaster County. So that was a main artery. So if you think of today, 222 has since bypassed 272. That corridor was all being fed down to get to Lancaster right past uh, Jacob Landis's blacksmith shop and eventually past what would be uh, the site of the hotel. So in the early 1850s though, something happens. Uh, there is a new company that starts to be formed uh, that is for the Lancaster and Ephrata uh, Turnpike and Plank Road. So you can see that this is a share of stock from 1855, uh, though this was started, I believe, in 1853. And you'll notice whose share uh, this is. This is Jacob Landis, the, the person. Uh, so this is Jacob Landis Jr., the person who eventually builds the hotel. And he actually starts construction of the hotel later uh, in 
1855. So the year that he invests $50 uh, into buying shares of this new uh, improved road, he also then starts to build the hotel. So here is a map uh, from 1864 that shows down below where Lancaster City is located. And this area down here is where, you know, we affectionately call the Golden Triangle, uh, where you have all the different pikes that meet uh, just south of uh, modern Route 30. And if you see down in this area, this is marked Lancaster and Ephrata Turnpike. So by 1864, uh, the road has already been built. You can see here uh, down at the Golden Triangle that there's a toll house that's been built uh, for that road. And if you see, that takes you all the way up to where the hotel is, uh, which is, this is the area where Landis Valley is located. And other people that were along the road also invested. So this is, again, uh, the Shriner Farm, just a little bit uh, north of Landis Valley. You can see, you know, here's the hotel. Here's the Shriner Farm. This is the Shriner Wagon that is in the collection. And here uh, is Henry Shriner who's buying 12 shares of stock at $25 a piece, which in 1860 was a considerable amount of money. Other people in and around the area were also uh, buying stock. Uh, Henry Lehman, who was a gunsmith uh, in Lancaster, had a rural farm in and around Oregon. He was an investor. So we saw lots of people in that area uh, investing because, of course, if they have traffic going past their property, uh, it improves their property's value. So it was a way of, of improving value for the property. So Jacob Landis Jr., when he builds this hotel in 1855, opens it in 1856, doesn't keep it very long. Uh, he, by 1860, he's out of the business. By 1862, he's, he's passed. So this is a, an early uh, photo of the hotel. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about next some of the activities that took place at the hotel. And then kind of the final uh, chapter that we'll talk about is some of the, the owners and also some of the operators of the hotel because they at times were very different people. So one of the first things we're gonna do is look at newspapers. Uh, that's the one great thing is that in most of the time in which the hotel is operating, there's very good local press. Uh, there are newspapers that are in Lancaster, but there are also newspapers in the much smaller towns. And uh, from those newspapers, you can glean all these little wonderful stories and things that happen just everywhere in, in kind of rural Pennsylvania, German areas of Lancaster County. Like the ad that's on here, you could see at the very bottom, a fox chase was advertised to take place from the Landis Valley Hotel last Saturday, but it was postponed. So we know all these different activities because they make it into the local newspapers. Now, that's not to say very much because if you look at some of these newspapers, they'll even talk about who went visiting who, who came in from out of town, very mundane things, but oftentimes you can glean a lot of really interesting information uh, from these papers. So here we are, uh, Landis Valley uh, as a location wasn't really named Landis Valley until the hotel was built, but what really put it on the map was when it became a postal designation. So in 1857, you can see that there was an article that was put into one of the local newspapers talking about postal affairs. And it says at the very top here, also Landis Valley, Jacob Landis Postmaster. And it's talking about you know, making this new post office. 180 families residing within two miles will thus be accommodated with regular mail supplies six times a week by route from Lancaster to Hinkletown. So you learn a lot from that. Number one, that you know, the postal designation included 180 families. So we're looking at much more than just the few houses within Landis Valley. This is going out, out over a fairly broad area in this section of Mannheim Township. Uh, but you'll also see that in 1907, there is a, another article when the post office was to be discontinued. And you can see that there's 50 years difference between the two. 
Uh, however, I think that the post office had actually gotten a reprieve and doesn't actually shut down to about 1913. So, and another great thing, if you look at the very top of the slide, the Landis Valley Post Office sign, that's original. That used to hang uh, from, the, uh, from the hotel and is currently, I think if it's still there, currently on display in the country store in the back where there's a, a little post office set up. Uh, that's where the sign uh, is displayed. And also the original sign for the hotel uh, still exists. So, and, and that's uh, in the hotel itself. So this is a, a great photograph, has nothing to do with the, uh, the article, but it's just too great of a photograph not to use. Uh, it's showing a man uh, by the name of Niedermeyer the Butcher uh, from Oregon. So that's Oregon just up the road uh, from Landis Valley. Uh, and he has this big hunk of meat that he's handing over uh, to the then proprietor of the Landis Valley Hotel, a man by the name of Jacob Dewing. Uh, but the article that I have here from August of 1868 is actually talking about the Republican primary election. So it's talking about where the, uh, what the slate of candidates is and also where you can go ahead and vote. So if you look at it, the very bottom, I have the arrow in Mannheim Township at the public house of Isaac B. Miller at Landis Valley. So at least in this period, uh, the hotel is being used as a polling place. So if you go back and, and think about years ago, uh, you couldn't get a drink on election day anywhere because bars were closed. And a lot of that goes back to this time period when some hotels were used as polling places and they didn't want to give uh, undue uh, take away business from those areas that were acting as polling places. So what they did is they used to shut all of them down from selling alcohol so that the, you know, there would be places that would actually serve as polling places for that. So that's one of those old Pennsylvania blue laws that I can remember from my youth, which is, you know, long, long since gone. This is another story, uh, a real tragic story. Uh, and that's the reason why it made it into the newspaper. So this is a little newspaper in Columbia, Lancaster County called the Columbia Spy. This is also online. You can go ahead and search this. And it talks about a shooting match. So this talks about a serious accident occurred on Saturday afternoon at a shooting match at the public house of W.L. Halk. W.L., that's Wallace Halk, uh, at Landis Valley, this county. The victim being David Hurst of Eden. Several matches had already been shot, and a boy named Landis Hostetter was in the act of reloading a breech-loading gun when a cartridge prematurely exploded and shot striking young Hurst who was 15 feet off in the left shoulder and inflicted a terrible wound. And then goes on to talk about the terrible wound and, and who attended it. So, you know, from this, you know, awful incident, we learned that at times they were having, you know, recreational things like shooting matches. I, I showed you the little article about a fox hunt. So, you know, the taverns were being used as, as a real social uh, place where, you know, activities were going on. Uh, just a follow-up, though, to that story, uh, this Landis Hostetter uh, did meet a rather sad end. Uh, also from uh, the newspapers, excuse me a moment. Uh, this was kind of a salacious story, so uh, usually what happened is in the old days, instead of having the AP wire, newspapers would subscribe to other newspapers. And if there was a story they thought their readership would like, they would literally just yank it out word for word and put it into their paper, you know, a few days a week later. Uh, so this was a story that I actually picked up from the Cambria Freeman, which was a, a newspaper out of Evansburg, Pennsylvania, which is West of State College. And, uh, but it showed up not only in the Lancaster paper, but it showed up in the Philadelphia paper, Wilkes-Barre, Pottsville, even in Cumberland, Maryland. And it talks about this Landis Hostetter, who's the one who shot uh, this other boy. And it said, the body of Landis Hostetter, a young man who had been missing from home for a week, has been found in the little Conestoga Creek with the throat cut from ear to ear. 
The fact that his watch and money were found on the body leads to believe that this was a case of suicide. So, and he's buried next door uh, from the museum in the cemetery at Landis Valley. And when I looked at this, this is about eight years after that shooting had taken place. So uh, that may have led to some other issues uh, that happened in, in his, his rather young life. Now here are two other stories uh, that deal with uh, auctions that were happening at the public house. Uh, in particular, uh, livestock uh, auctions or cattle auctions. So on the right hand side is uh, an article that's just an ad from 1888 uh, that's talking about that, you know, a public sale at the, at the public house of Hannah Houck at Landis Valley, the following 15 head of choice Western Colts. And uh, it was uh, an auction that happened uh, or was happening or, or being uh, sponsored by Henry Hilton. And over the years, Henry Hilton ran a number of livestock auctions uh, out of, of the premises there. But the article on the left is a very interesting one because uh, not only is it fairly early in the, in the history of the hotel, it dates from January of 1870, uh, but it shows uh, a hotel owner and operator, uh, Henry Brackbill, being called into a law case. And what happens is that a man by the name of John Shirk was taking logs across Binkley's Bridge. And when he did, uh, the timbers underneath started cracking. And as they started cracking and giving way, he's able to get off the bridge. But now people want to know, did he overload his load of logs? And is he responsible for the damage that's done to the bridge? So Henry Brackbill was brought into this court case because at his public house in 1870, he has uh, what he's calling his large cattle scales. So prior to going across the bridge, uh, John Shirk pulled his load up onto that, that cattle scale. And if you read this, it says, uh, Henry Brackbill, I weighed the wagon and log hauled by, uh, hauled by Mr. Shirk at my large cattle scales at Landis Valley. Produces book where the weight was recorded. So he was keeping a ledger uh, of those things. It weighed six ton, 995 pounds. This is nothing but a good common six horse load. So we know that at least by 1870, they're doing enough business in cattle auctions that Henry Brackbill has a cattle scale there. And uh, we do have within the collection at Landis Valley, a picture of a cattle auction that's going on and the scale. So right now, just to give you a little bit of orientation, the building to the far right is, the building is currently being used as a seed house. So that's that building there. Uh, you can see another roof line here. That's where the current blacksmith shop is located. Uh, there was another house that was identical to the seed house that was there that was torn down in the 1960s and then the uh, current blacksmith shop was brought in. And in front of it is the cattle scale. So it's a covered building that you're able to run cattle in and weigh them. And if you see this group of people that are here, lots of dark coats, lots of men, that's the ring where the cattle are being auctioned off that day. And you can see uh, two cattle here being led away. And then what was the, the sale barn uh, next door where the current uh, farm machinery and tool building uh, stands. Now this has become a pretty lucrative business for the Landis family because uh, people would go around and buy uh, cattle or horses or whatever, and they would be a dealer. They would come into the area, they would buy up livestock, and then they would take them somewhere else. But unlike buying used cars, you can't just take a cow or a horse and just have them cool their heels for a week or two after buying all your, your livestock and getting them at one point. So Henry Landis, so this is H.H. Uh, Landis, the father, for a number of years made a business in keeping people's livestock from the auction. And then they would pay a daily fee uh, for them being taken care of and also having access uh, to the pasture. So that was you know, one of the things that kind of shows up in the records where uh, one of the local people, in this case, you know, Henry Landis, father of the founders, is financially gaining uh, from the hotel being right across the street from, from his property. 
aside from cattle sales, there are other public auctions that are going on. And this was a very common thing. You know, today in Pennsylvania Dutch country, if someone wants to put their property up for auction, an auctioneer goes, they sign a contract, they put a sign out. And on that day, everyone shows up at that house and they sell the contents, the real estate or both. Uh, but in the 18th century and the 19th century, a much more common practice was that people went and looked at the property well ahead of time. And then the auction actually happened at a nearby public house. So what you see here is an ad from 1865 for an auction. And it's saying uh, that this is happening at the public house of John Martin in Landis Valley in Mannheim Township. And it's for uh, this house, two acres and 23 perches, situated in Landis Valley, adjoining the lands of Henry Landis, John Royer, John Crisp, uh, and the said Turnpike Road, where is erected a two-story frame weatherboarded dwelling house with kitchen attached and frame stable, carriage house, butcher shop, pigsty, smokehouse, a well of never failing water near the door, an orchard with choice collection of fruit trees, such as apples, peaches, pears, and blah, blah, blah. And they're also selling a thousand pails of fence. And uh, this is being sold by Catherine Landis. Now I had mentioned before, Jacob Landis Jr. dies in 1862. His wife or his widow was Catherine Landis. And it appears that she owned one of the houses that was developed along uh, the road, the Reading Road between the hotel and the Brick Farmstead, because of course that had all been their property at one point. So in 1865, they're auctioning off that property. Most likely, this is the current seed house. Uh, so this is uh, an early sale of that. And one of the ways that we're able to tell when that building was purchased or, or built because this was being uh, called a newly built building in 1865. There are other ads for other local properties as well. Uh, if you see, there is uh, a property here from 1866 of 76 acres of land, also at the public house of John Martin at Landis Valley. And to the right, uh, an ad for 1869 for actually two frame uh, houses uh, to be sold. And if you look in the lower left, there's a picture of these two frame houses. One is still standing along Landis Valley Road. Uh, if you go out of the, uh, the parking lot of the museum and make a right, uh, go past uh, Delp Road, uh, first, at least it used to be first house to the left is uh, this two front door house. Now, right before that, there's a little area that Landis Valley Museum used to own, or still owns, but used to have a little red barn on it uh, that was demolished when a large tree fell on it about 10 years ago. This photograph of the people that are, I believe, picking up potatoes, in the background, that's that little red barn. And this is on this little triangle of grass between Delp Road and Landis Valley Road. And you can also see the little frame house which is another two front door house. And these both show up on this 1899 map as being owned by PR, Peter R. Landis. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about him in a little bit. So uh, let's go ahead and look at some of the owners and operators of uh, the hotel. Now they were not always, of course, the same person. Uh, you had people that owned the hotel, but oftentimes leased uh, the hotel out to other people. So, of course, Jacob Landis Jr. was an early owner and operator of the hotel. But if you start to look at the, the list on the right, you see a lot of additional names that are worked in there. Uh, and you can see it's a, not an unbroken chain of title. There are some areas there that uh, not all the work's been done. If you look to the right, there are also some, some holes. So there are some areas there where there further research can be done. But one of the first people to look at is this gentleman by the name of Henry Brackbill. So Henry Brackbill uh, not only was a neighbor of Henry Landis, but they were indeed uh, first cousins. So that's the one thing in Landis Valley uh, you can't swing a dead cat without hitting a Landis, even if the last name isn't Landis. 
So you can see here that Henry H. or Landis' father was Henry. Henry L. Brackbill's mother was Barbara. So their siblings, their first cousins. And as first cousins, they tended to do things together. This is a, an excerpt of H.H. Uh, Landis's diary from 1876. And he's talking about Rose as usual, took breakfast. And then he said that he went up to the valley. That's the way that he always describes going to the hotel. He went up to the valley. Uh, and then he went to Lancaster with Henry Brackbill because they were both witnesses in a court case uh, of Amos Kaufman's. And when you go through H.H. Uh, Landis's diary for that year, I think there's another at least half dozen times where he's talking about H.L. Uh, Brackbill, never refers to him as his cousin, just always mentions him by name, and they're doing different things together. Now, Henry Brackbill is a rather interesting person because he also owns another piece of property uh, aside from the hotel. He also owns the brick farm. So the brick farm went through uh, a rather quick succession of owners. So after Jacob Landis Jr. sells that property, uh, it actually goes to Henry Landis, uh, the grandfather of Henry and George Landis, founders of the museum. I know you almost need a, a genealogy chart to keep track of all these different folks. Uh, and then eventually, uh, Henry Brackbill ends up owning that. So you can see here uh, that farm, sorry, that farm is nine acres. And it also has here that he's owning the hotel at five acres. So at that time, he owns 14 acres of land on that side, including the hotel, uh, the adjacent sale stable, and then what is now the brick farm. Uh, even afterwards, this is a, a map from 1899. You can see a little bit more clearly the ownership where it's showing him owning uh, the brick farm directly across the lane then is H.H. Landis and Emma. This is the, the home place uh, house standing along Oregon uh, uh, 272 and then also the Landis brothers house at that time. So just to give you an idea of the neighborhood. So here is another owner operator of the hotel. This is a man by the name of Levi Longenecker. So he owns this right around 1880. He's actually in the hotel <clears throat> at the time that the census is taken. So this is the census document from 1880. It lists out Levi, uh, his wife, Mary, uh, his two sons, Harry and Wayne, but this is what I find very interesting. He's living in the hotel in 1880. So the other members of quote unquote, his household are his employees. So from that, we know that Martin Hacker is listed as bartender. Uh, Lewis Herzl is a hostler. So what he's doing is he's the person responsible for taking care of the horses as they're coming in. So, and then also Eliza Whitcraft as a domestic service. Uh, servant. So most likely she's helping with uh, the cooking of meals within the restaurant that people would be getting and also just, you know, generally keeping things up. So Levi Longenecker, uh, his obituary also appears in one of the local newspapers. And I'll just skip to kind of the middle of this. So Mr. Longenecker was born in Mannheim Township in 1854. He was married to Mary and Frank, who died about six years ago. In his younger days, Mr. Longenecker carried on farming in the vicinity of Landis Valley and later kept the Landis Valley Hotel. So people weren't always hotel keepers their entire lives. Sometimes they did it as a young person or sometimes they did it as an older person. Sometimes they owned, sometimes they rented. There are a lot of different ways that people were involved in, in keeping hotels. So I'm going to move on to another uh, hotel keeper. Uh, this is a, a man by the name of Wallace Houck. And if you look here, this is the 1870 census for Mannheim Township. And at the very bottom, he's 13 years old. His father, George, is 58. His mother, Elizabeth, 52. So keep that in mind. So this is uh, a map of the Landis Valley area in 
1875. And George Houck, Wallace's father, owned the farm just north of Landis Valley. It's currently owned by Mennonites, the ones you can see here, and also owned this farm, 48 acres here, that's currently owned uh, by Nelson Rohr, uh, that's just south of his uh, farm there adjacent to, to Landis Valley. So this is a little back road that uh, takes you over uh, and across Route uh, 222. So, you know, from a fairly well-to-do farming family, has a couple of farms in the area, uh, but you can see that it's his estate. So he's passed by this time. And here in Landis Valley proper, you can see Mrs. E. Hauk, two acres. So she as the widow has moved into the village, so to speak, and is living there in, in Landis Valley. And of course, her son's rather young, so he's living there as well. So this is the 1880 census, uh, Elizabeth Houck and Wallace uh, living uh, there as uh, in, the, in the town. But let's go back to that story from 1886 uh, from the Columbia Spy and the, uh, and the young boy getting, getting shot. When you look at it, it says that it's the public house of W.L. Houck, so Wallace Houck. So he's keeping the hotel at the time that that accident happens. <clears throat> Unfortunately, though, he doesn't keep it very long. Uh, Wallace Houck dies when he's 30 years old and he leaves a widow and a child. And something else that's very common uh, that happens when uh, a tavern owner or tavern keeper dies is that the widow actually then takes over uh, the lease. So later on, you'll see not Wallace Houck in charge of the hotel, <clears throat> but you'll see Hannah Houck in this uh, story that's here. Uh, it talks about not only Hannah Houck taking over uh, the hotel, but she also takes over as the postmistress of Landis Valley. So here, you know, this is a very common thing that a widow taking over what had been, you know, the job of her husband. So this is, I believe, the last family that I'm going to talk about that, that was in the hotel. This is John and Sarah Getz. And this is one of the, the few photos that we have of someone aside from Jacob doing uh, that actually kept the hotel. And their marriage certificate is, is also on this page. Uh, they had five children uh, that also would have lived in the hotel. You can see Bertha, Irvin, Ellis, Gertrude, and Clarence. Another interesting thing, the family of, of this family had actually come in and allowed us to photograph a lot of these things. So that's where this comes from. Although this is a document that's wrapped in saran wrap because it was very fragile, uh, it's very interesting because it is the appointment of John Getz as the postmaster of Landis Valley. And the thing that I loved about the document is who it's signed by. So the Postmaster General at that time was John Wanamaker of Wanamaker's department store fame in Philadelphia. So that, that's who signed this document. And I thought that was just a very uh, interesting signature to have on a, on a document. And uh, John Getz shows up in the paper quite a bit because not only did he keep the hotel at Landis Valley, but he kept other hotels. So in the top one from 1890, uh, it's talking about H.L. Uh, Usner will vacate the Rome Hotel next Tuesday to be succeeded by Levi Longenecker. We heard that name before of Landis Valley. Um, but it also goes and talks about John Getz, the popular ho hotel keeper at the Roseville, were removed to the Landis Valley Hotel. So at times, all these guys that are, are renting or leasing hotels they're moving to other hotels and the newspapers talking about where all these guys are moving. Uh, the bottom there it talks about Mr. Getz, formerly hotel keeper at Landis Valley, has taken charge of the Franklin House barrooms in Lancaster. So again, this seemed to be more of his profession. Now this is probably one of the strangest stories that I found about any of the hotel keepers and what was going on. And this is a story 
from the Lidditz record. So it, it might have been a slow news day, but they really did make a good story out of this. And this is talking about the wild hog of Landis Valley. So the wild hog of Landis Valley has been caught. On Tuesday, he did considerable damage to the crops in the neighborhood. And on Wednesday morning, he was seen near the village. 15 men pursued him and finally came upon him in the field of John Bassler, a mile from Landis Valley. The men who first came to him were John Getz, so hotel proprietor, and Henry Brackbill. So Henry Brackbill had been proprietor of the hotel, uh, who were soon joined by others. They ran him into the corner of a field and someone struck him on the head with a stone, which affected him to some extent. They then quickly bound a rope around the body and tied his legs together. So they go on to talk a little bit more about how this thing was the scourge. Uh, he did a great deal of damage to crops during the night and slept mostly in green fields in the daytime. He was a terror to potato patches and could give a farmer tips on cutting off new corn. So they had been trying. This is actually only one of three newspaper articles that I found about this pig. You know, the one talking about the pig this one, they caught it, and also the one about how they got rid of the pig. You know, I just assumed that, you know, this was not going to live, you know, a happy life on a farm somewhere. They were going to eat him. Unfortunately, what they did instead is that they had a fox hunt with a pig. So they released the pig, and, and a group of guys on horseback rode this thing down across the countryside, and the newspaper said, until it dropped over dead. So that's how they got rid of the pig, the, the scourge of Landis Valley. Uh, but this is probably the saddest part of the story of, of Landis Valley House Hotel and also about uh, John Getz. So this is a newspaper article that appears in the New Holland Clarion in 1892. And it says, two children of John Getz, hotel keeper of Landis Valley, died on Friday afternoon of last week of diphtheria. And then it goes on to say this double sorrow was doubled again on Thursday morning when two more daughters died from the same terrible disease. So, you know, just in a very short time, the five Getz children became the three, or I'm sorry, the one Getz child. And we learned from that family eventually when they did come and see us that the one child who got away, John Getz, if you look, at the kid to the right of, of, the, of the photo, this is him as he's graduating uh, from pharmacy school. So he went on to become a pharmacist, uh, went to, into Philadelphia, and then survived to have children. So I do just have a couple more minutes. These are some quick slides to run through. I'm running a little longer than I wanted to. This is kind of a postscript of the Landis Valley House Hotel because it acted as a hotel from 1856 until the state bought it in 1967. So during that entire time, it always had served food, drink, it ceased lodging about 1930, but it had acted then as, as more of a restaurant after that time period. Uh, but when the Commonwealth bought it, it was still a, a going concern they just had taken and bought the property because they wanted to expand the museum at that time. The photo that I'm showing you, though, is a very interesting one. It is taken from the vantage point of where the country store currently is located. And this is the Landis family that owned the Isaac Landis farm. This was one of their best fields is where the parking lot and all of that now is located. So this is looking at a bale press coming by and making uh, hay bales. But in the back, just here, is actually gas pumps. So in the triangle in the middle of Landis Valley at one time, the hotel, that always went with that piece of property. So the hotel keepers by this time period, which would have been late 30s, early 40s, had put gas pumps in the triangle. And that way they could be serviced from all these different roads that were leading into the center. Uh, this is the Landis uh, Brothers house on the right hand side. What is the farm machinery and tool barn location here on the left and just a very corner of the hotel. So, you know, this was still being used actively. It went, you know, from, from serving horses at one time to also serving automobiles, you know, later in the 20th century. 
And this is what the building looked like in the late 1960s when the Commonwealth bought it. It was a brick building, but it had been stuccoed over. Uh, they had had these concrete and wood porch posts put onto it, high curbing. You can see the roads are paved. And from the late 60s into the early 70s, there were a number of projects that were done uh, to strip off the stucco, remove the porches, uh, and then you know, replace with more appropriate porches. You saw all the photos that I had of the hotel that were historic images. So there were plenty good photos to go off of to, to aid in that, in that restoration process. Uh, even in the back, you could see replacement of porches. Uh, you can also see the scar where uh, the kitchen addition had been. Uh, so that you know, was added back on a, a, an addition onto the back of the building. Uh, time was not kind to the inside of this building. You can imagine something that had been used as a bar uh, for 110 years. Uh, so over time, uh, and you know, taste changed. The interior became uh, naughty pine, or as some preservationists would call it, naughty pine, uh, that they go ahead and put over uh, everything. So that all was also stripped away. Uh, so that the interior of the building uh, then was restored to what we think it would have looked like uh, closer to the turn of the 20th century. The other thing that had happened was the building where the farm machinery and tool barn was located, uh, what had at one time served as uh, the sales barn was long since gone and was replaced by this uh, kind of arched roof building that was built in the 1940s. And at one time was even the storage building for a, a Nash car dealership in downtown Lancaster. Uh, it was too good of a building to get rid of in that when the Commonwealth took over Landis Valley, one of the things that was really lacking was just space to do anything. So the, the oral history is, is that when they wanted to try to go ahead and catalog things and put like with like, they had this large structure. So piles of things went into the building to be able to try to begin uh, or, or really get a hold of the, the cataloging process. So what they did, instead of getting rid of the building, they simply skinned over it to make it look like that earlier photo. So here is the building as it stood with a metal skin going over it. And then eventually the building that's there, making it look somewhat like that early uh, sales stable. And of course, it had paved roads. So one of the last things that the Commonwealth did was to tear out all of the paved roads to make them dirt again. So, and that's really what I have. So I hope that uh, you enjoyed uh, the talk, got a little bit more information out of it. And if there are any additional questions, I'd be happy to give them a shot. Yeah, Mike. Um... We have uh, someone asking, do you know any additional information about Brackville versus Graver? Hmm. I do not. I do not. Okay. Okay. Another question is, I guess this what is, was on some of the census uh, materials. Is the reference to Hannah as, quote, he merely an error? Most likely. <laughs> Most likely, yeah. There, uh, yes, yes, that's, that's, I'm sure, is an error. So I, I can't help but think that um, a, a pig that is hunted as a fox would be a, a, a pox on Landis Valley. That's what it appeared. And, and when the earlier uh, newspaper article, when I read that, they had been trying to catch this pig for weeks. And as soon as they got near it, it would run away and that would be it. And then, you know, the next day, someone's potato patch would be ripped up or someone's uh, corn crop, which, you know, just been planted, gets cut down to the ground. So, you know, the farmers, I guess, had quite a bit enough of it. So, I can imagine after they literally had this thing hogtied that they very triumphantly, you know, carried this thing overhead down to the hotel. 
Um, and then just maybe a general comment. I don't know if your research uh, uncovered this, but in the 18th century up to and beyond the Revolutionary War, there are international commentators as well as other folks uh, who come to America and talk about uh, folks being prestigious consumers of alcohol here on the Atlantic seaboard. As you fast forward to the early Republic, by the time he builds this in the mid 1850s, A, do you know if uh, uh, alcohol uh, consumption remains high within the uh, national population? And then also, what is he serving within uh, the bar? Is it spirits? Is it beer? Is it hard cider? All of the above? Do you, um, do you, have any such I, I can take educated guesses on all of that since we don't have records from that particular hotel. 1850s is kind of an interesting time to open up a hotel because you really start to see these divergent paths in uh, America. You know, you have a temperance movement that is founded only a couple of decades before this. And in Lancaster County, you see people opening what they call temperance hotels. So they are establishments where you can stay. They're places where you can get something to eat. However, you cannot get a drop of liquor uh, to, to save your life. Now, I know for a fact that this one was not a temperance hotel. This was one in which uh, they're serving alcohol because Henry Landis in his diaries talks about going across the street or as he calls it up to the valley and at times coming home drunk and then getting in fights with his wife, Emma. So, you know, we have, you know, very good authority in what's going on there uh, because Henry does, you know, keep his diary uh, intermittently over a 50 year time period, but this 1876 diary is a very good one. Uh, so is one from 1913. So <clears throat> he's talking about going and doing that. We know from, from Lancaster by this time, there are a number of breweries, there are a number of distilleries in town, uh, but you, you start to have people, um, again, because of the temperance movement, you start to have traditional groups that were in those businesses start to go out of those businesses. Uh, some of the best distillers in Lancaster County before the temperance movement were Mennonites. Uh, but by this time period, you start to have people kind of question that a little bit. So you don't see as many, you know, Mennonites that are in that or then they start to get out of the business a little bit more. So from what's existing and what's what ads are out in those newspaper, it appears that it's a lot of beer and a lot of whiskey. So you're right, David, from the 18th century, we would have seen uh, rum drinks, we would have seen bowls of alcohol that would have been served. Uh, you would have seen hard cider. You would have seen hard cider that was distilled down to make Applejack. Uh, you would have seen, you know, all these different types of, of drinks that were coming out, but that's started to transition by this time period. So during the vast majority of the hotel, a lot of the drinks that would have been served would be very common things that we would see in a bar today. Great. Minus the mixed cocktails. Of course, of course. Um, um, if, you, if there are any other questions, please put them in chat. Uh, that's all the questions at this point, uh, Mike. We, we do have a participant who shares that he thinks the hotel is, or he knows that the hotel is his favorite building within Landis Valley. As being new to uh, the museum, what I appreciate is that here's the small crossroads that uh, is filled with personal stories. Yet when you take uh, these families in this one building at a crossroads going all directions throughout the 18th, 19th and into the 20th century, it's um, a microcosm of the Pennsylvania story, of the Mid-Atlantic story and of the American story right here in our own backyard. And I appreciate it that it's uh, layers of history above and beyond George and Henry Landis, above and beyond the, the collection. It's really um, a brilliant representation of, uh, of uh, where we hang our hats in Lancaster County and the growth of the county and 
the county's growth in the context of the larger region. And all of this from the small triangle of uh, land at these roads and these points meeting. Yeah, and it's certainly fortunate when you look at, at it from a standpoint of had the Commonwealth not acquired that piece of property, had, had this just, you know, right now you have the intersection around 272 and Landis Valley Road. And it's a very busy crossroads with businesses at every corner. Had the Commonwealth not acquired it, most likely that intersection would be right there in Landis Valley because <laughs> that was the major intersection. Yeah. And it was only by, you know, the rerouting of the road that that development happened south. So it preserved what was the 19th century development, you know, what was uh, pristine farmland even before all of that was built. Uh, but, you know, it, in other ways, you know, time does march on and development continues. So it is a real great way of looking at what a crossroads community would look like and a crossroad community that was very much based in uh, the hotel and also in the Mennonite church, you know, the sacred and profane, one at one end of town and one at the other. So uh, it's, it's a, a nice place to tell that, that rural story, uh, Pennsylvania journal Great. story. So we'll call this the last question. One of our uh, participants uh, shares that during one of their visits to Landis Valley, uh, was told that the hotel was known for its turtle soup and ham sandwiches. Do you know if this is true? And that is, and that is very true. So uh, I, the one thing is that a lot of the newspaper accounts and things start to really peter out by like the teens and the early 20s because news isn't being consumed kind of the same way. But from the 1950s and 60s, we have a lot of oral history uh, of that establishment some of the owners and some know what they're serving. So in a hotel, there's a sign that talks about turtle soup. That's, that's why that's in there. And the oral history is, is that uh, local families would actually send down one of the kids to go get a ham sandwich at the hotel. And the ham sandwiches were so thick that families would then take them apart and build like several ham sandwiches out of it to go ahead and feed the family. Uh, you know, there are some people that said, you know, the, the sandwiches were, you know, three inches thick, three inches thick. So, you know, a good thrifty Dutchman was not going to eat three inches of ham. They're going to spread that out amongst uh, a better part of the family. Well, uh, Michael, thank you so much about sharing your passion uh, for not only this history, but helping to link it not only to the Landis uh, family, but to your to your family, too. So thank you for sharing. Thank you for the stories. Um, one last time, uh, two more presentations uh, coming up on April 15th will be the uh, PHMC uh, Collection Showcase uh, featuring the theme of sports. Uh, that's 7 o'clock on the 15th of April. And on the 20th of April will be our next virtual Landis lecture uh, with Dr. Leroy um, Hopkins uh, talking about the African-American experience in 18th, 19th century, Lancaster County, and the intersection with Pennsylvania Dutch um, history. Um, we um, hope to have this um, on our YouTube uh, channel for those of you who want to uh, share this with others. And we appreciate you uh, joining us on this uh, lovely uh, early spring evening. So Michael, behalf of all of us, thank you so much for your time and the presentation. And we're really happy to have had you here. Hey, thank you very much, David. You bet. So with that, everyone, I wish you um, a good night. And we hope to uh, have Landis uh, uh, back open for you sometime this spring. Keep an eyes on our website and uh, hopefully you'll be seeing good news soon. So with that, uh, Good night.